Okay. Hello. So this is a joint work between Imperial College London and the University of Glasgow. <clears throat> and the topic is uh, how to implement programs that implement protocols in a way that can be statically type checked. So I will start with an example. So let's say that we have this specification to implement. It is a common setting for an uh, internet peer-to-peer -peer game where you have uh, three players, PA, PB, and PC, that don't know each other but they want to play a game, so they connect to a matchmaking server here, and the server sends to each player <clears throat> a message that essentially gives them some information so they know each other. After this, the players can start interacting directly. So here they exchange some messages, so here we have B sends something to C, then C to A, then A to, to B, and then they start the main game loop where A can choose which move to send to B, then B sends a move to C, C answers to A by choosing something, and so on in a, in a recursion. Uh, now, implementing this is not trivial. There are several issues to tackle. Uh, the protocols are structured, there are choices, there are dependencies between messages, there is recursion, and even the topology of the communication changes. So this so this setting starts with a client-to-server uh, interaction and then moves to a peer-to-peer -peer interaction. So there is always the risk of implementing this, introducing protocol, protocol violations and or deadlocks, for instance. So is there a way to address this challenge in a formally grounded way with some static compile time guarantees on the correctness of the implementation? This is what we address in this work. And the way we do it is essentially leverage the theory of multi-party session types to turn protocol specifications into types, and in particular into Scala APIs. And we do that in two steps. We first have some formal results by encoding the full multi-party session calculus into the linear PyCalculus, and then we use this encoding to essentially generate Scala APIs that uh, represent the protocol itself. And with this approach, we have several nice properties that I will explain during the talk. Mostly, everything is step, step safe, is choreographic, and uh, also we managed to implement for the first time something called distributed multi-party session delegation in a type safe uh, and correct way. And I, I will explain all these things during the talk. Now, first, some background on multi-party session types. The multi-party session typing framework is a formal framework for uh, interacting processes, interacting through channels, and the idea is that you start from a global type that describes a protocol with many participants that interact. You project this protocol on each participant, so you see what each participant, each role in the protocol is supposed to do, and then you use this local type to type check processes. So as an example, this is what a global type looks like, and this describes the game protocol from the first slide. So it roughly says, the first thing is that B sends to C an info BC message carrying a string, then C sends to A an info C message, then A sends to B info EB, and then there is this recursion where A chooses what to send to B, B sends to C, and so on, and then everything loops. This is the global view of the protocol. This can be projected, for instance, on B to see what B is supposed to do here. And uh, the result is this local type T of B that says, okay, B must first send info BC to C, then wait to receive info AB from A, and then enter this loop where it must wait for two possible messages that it may receive from A, and so on. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, these types are assigned to channels and they can express the notion of delegation. That is the idea of sending a channel through a channel to pass, let's say, the, some part of interactions elsewhere. So for instance, this type here says that from the server, I'm waiting for a play B message whose payload is a channel of type TB. So after this channel is received, it should be used in this way. Now, 
these types are used on processes with channels. I will not show you the exact syntax of these multi-party processes because it's a bit cryptic. Instead, I will try to give you an idea using this pseudo Scala code. And the idea is that this implementation of B first waits for a message from the server, then takes the payload of the message, Y, and then uses Y to send a message to C, then to receive a message from A, and then to do a loop to send and receive more messages. This is the multi-party delegation I was uh, mentioning in the last slide. And uh, to see it graphically, you can imagine this scenario where we have the game server here that is connected to the three clients through these red sessions. Now, to set up the game, the server creates an internal session as here with the three players and then sends one endpoint, the B endpoint of this multi-party session to B, which is what happens here. B receives the, its part of the session in this point. And after the server keeps delegating, so send, sends each endpoint of the session to the three processes, the result is that when later B interacts to C and A, we'll be actually interacting with, with these three processes. So not with the server, but with the other players. This is pretty powerful. It actually implements the topology, the, net, the communication topo topology change of the specification. And moreover, it can be type checked. The session typing system can ensure that, for instance, S of B here is used to receive a play B message carrying a channel of this type TB, which is in Y here. And this TB in turn is the projection of the global game specification on B, which is what we want. And if you type check everything, every process in an ensemble, and verify that every process is playing a certain role, then you can be sure that everything will be uh, deadlock free and type safe. This is pretty powerful. It would be nice to write actual code that looks uh, like this. It looks, oh my, I think I just lost my pointer, so I will use my mouse. Uh, yeah. So it would be nice to write pr uh, programs that look roughly like this that can be similarly checked. The issue is that the multi-party session types theory is actually a bit far, quite far away from what you would expect on standard mainstream programming languages. It is a very high level uh, theory. The very notion of multi-party session is very high level. The theory is quite rich and sometimes, sometimes even intricate. So to bridge the gap and bring this to use, essentially we needed to do three things. First, find a way to decompose the multi-party sessions into binary channels in a correct and type safe way. And this is needed because in practice, binary channels is what we use. For instance, think of TCP IP sockets. And then we need to figure out how to actually implement correctly the multi-party delegation, and then also provide some APIs that give all these things in a user-friendly user way in some mainstream programming language. Now, uh, this is not Immediate, there is some previous work uh, on parts of these challenges. For instance, there are works that decompose multi-party sessions into binary channels, but introducing some centralized message routing that we don't want. We want uh, our interactions to be peer-to-peer. -peer. And also there are uh, works that generate Java APIs for multi-party protocols, but don't support delegation because the, the theoretical uh, ground they use does not allow for it. So in this work, what we do is we start from what we did last year, that is where we showed that binary sessions with just two participants can be actually represented in Scala using a library called L channels by going through an intermediate encoding into the linear PyCalculus. What we do this year in this work is we prove that you can also encode the full multi-party session calculus that is larger than the binary one in the linear pay calculus. And in this way, you for free get some way to implement, uh, implement parts of it. Um, and the intuition is that the linear pay calculus offers a very more low level 
calculus that is closer to implementation. And then once we do, the, do it, we use this encoding to actually generate Scala APIs in a way that follows the encoding that we prove to be correct in several respects. So the APIs as well are correct and mostly are based on what we implemented actually last year. So they are pretty uh, easy once you know what, how to do them. So now I, you know, I have a few slides where I will try to convey the idea behind the encoding because later it will show up in implementation. So let's say that we want to represent this multi-party session with this type we've seen earlier into the linear pi calculus where you only have binary channels that you can use once. Well, the, th the thing you do then is the, uh, you first isolate the binary channels connecting each role in this, in this case, three-party interaction, and then you have to type them separately. In this case, you give a type to Z1 and Z2 separately by observing what this multi-party type is doing, is doing towards A and C. This is, again, the type for player B. And the result of this operation, that I will not detail, but is uh, essentially just an, a linear input or output type. Here it's saying that the channel between B and A must be used to input an info AB message, which is the first thing that happens here to the string, while the channel BC must be used to output an info BC message, which is what happens here. And since the, the, the we only have basic input output types. We have to encode the continuation of the protocol as a continuation. So we must include in the message another channel. So here, essentially, whenever we receive this message, we also get an input channel to receive another message later. Here, when we send this InfoBC message, we also need to send an input channel that the recipient will use later to get another message from us. This is the intuition. And once you have it, then uh, a multi-party session is just a label tuple with one channel for each role we are going to talk to. And the type is obviously a, a label tuple type from here. Uh, now, this approach is type safe in, in linear pi calculus, but does not preserve the order of interaction. So by looking at this type, one does not know which channel should be used first. The answer is C, according to the original type. So when we encode processes, we actually re uh, recover this information, the correct ordering. Uh, I will now briefly show how, what, how an encoded process looks like. So this is the origin of the encoding. So it is a, this is a multi-party process that, through session S, sends an info BC message from B to C and continues SP prime. Now, the linear pi calculus encoding is a bit more verbose. So to encode this, you encode the typing context using the types from the, from the previous slide. And then you have a process that is pretty low level that essentially takes the tuple of channels that represents the multi-party session, unpacks it, allocates a continuation as a new channel with input, output, and points, uses the, the C channel as, the, as in here, to send info BC, but attaching a continuation, an input continuation as required by the type. And then it packs again the multi-party channel, updating the channel that has been just used with a new one, and then proceeds SP prime. So everything goes from being pretty high level to be pretty lower level and closer to an actual imperative programming language. And uh, notably, uh, our, in our encoding, we managed to preserve the distribution of the processes. So when we encode a parallel composition of P and Q, what we have is the encoding of P in parallel with the encoding of Q. And this is the main difference with previous approaches from Kyles, Perez, and Carbone et al. in previous paper where they uh, had uh, an encoding that essentially introduces more processes here to root messages and preserve the types. So with this, with this, we can prove several correctness properties. Our encoding is type preserving. It preserves the behavior of processes. So any execution of the multi-party process is mimicked 
by the encoding, every execution of the encoding corresponds to an execution of the original process. So everything matches. And also, if you are into theory, we also proved that our encoding is defined if and only if the tapping context in multi-party setting is consistent, is well-formed. And this is pretty interesting. I cannot go much into details, but essentially it says that we cover the whole theory and we also find uh, a pretty deep connection between the, the multi-party and the linear pay calculus words. But anyway, now we have the theory, we have uh, the, um, some, uh, some correctness results. How do we implement all of it? Well, fortunately, once we, this is from the previous slides, once we have determined that this multi-party type becomes something like this, we just need to implement it literally in the same way. So this is a tuple of, uh, a label tuple of channel types, of linear types in Scala. This could be represented as a case class with two fields, A and C, as in here. And these two fields are just input and or output of info AB or info BC, which in turn are message types that are composed by a string payload, as in here, and a continuation that is in this case an input type, as in here. Now, these input output classes were already provided last year by our, our work on the binary setting. So essentially, this already provides a way to implement multi-party multi delegation for free because now multi-party delegation, after all this work of encoding, is just delegating tuples of channels. So everything becomes really straightforward and straight from the theory now. And the only missing thing is, again, as in the previous slides, what is the correct order for using these two channels where to guide developers in using these classes what we do is just we add some send or receive method that provides only what the, the original type allowed to do. So if in this case, TB required to send info BC to C with a string. So we can generate a send method that takes a string and we'll do the right thing following the process encoding. So it will pick the channel for C, send the message, we'll get a continuation, this is some uh, L channel space magic that we created the continuations for you, and then return a continuation object with type T prime that where the channel to C is, is updated with a new type. And uh, this is type safe, has not cast anywhere, uh, for, uh, models the whole multi party session types theory. It's pretty simple because everything really is implemented at the L channels level, and also it's can be mechanically generated. And in this, indeed, what, this is what we did. So we, implement, we extended the Scribble tool for protocol verification to essentially take a global type and do automatically all I've shown during the presentation. So project the local types, encode the linear types, and generate the Scala APIs with those automatic send and receive methods. And now you, a developer can take those Scala APIs and use them to actually type check real programs. And uh, in the artifact, there are several examples and tutorials, including um, a, a fully typed HTTP server. So if you want to have a look, you can. And uh, just to give an idea of what kind of code you can write using those generated APIs, this is an example. So it, this is the B player of our game. This looks pretty close to the pseudocode a few, few slides ago here. A message is received and the payload is used after delegation to send and receive messages uh, to and from other participants. And uh, the nice thing is now that if you, for instance, try to send the wrong thing in the wrong point of the protocol, the Scala compiler can spot it at compile time and tell you what's wrong. Or if you forget to support a message that you may receive from another participant, the Scala compiler again can tell you. So this is it. So we presented the first encoding of the full multi-party session calculus into the linear pay calculus. And we used this encoding as a formal basis to provide a complete implementation of multi-party sessions in Scala, mostly reusing 
um, most uh, technical trickeries from last year, uh, from our paper last year on Scala and L channels. And this is the first implementation of multi-party sessions that actually covers distributed multi-party delegation. And uh, we, of course, we have some future work in mind. In particular, we want to extend the approach to other languages that already have now binary session support and have libraries that do that, like Haskell, OCaml, Rust, even if they may not support distribution, so we have to look into it. And also, we want to use the theoretical results of our, of our encoding to bring some, type, some, some deadlock freedom checking capabilities between the two calculi and possibly apply them to actual programs. So if you want to try our artifact, it's available. Uh, also, the artifact of, of last year has been updated, so the channels library with examples from this year's paper, they are available at these links, so if you want to try, feel free. This is it. Okay, thank you. Okay, any questions? Uh, Eric. Uh, I was wondering about this operational correspondence or operational equivalent result. As far as I can see, the multi-party session type would allow you to specify something like A sends, B sends, and C receives, and D receives. But swapping the two in the middle, you know, nothing can stop you from do that, doing that when it's expressed peer-to-peer. So there must be some kind of slack between the two. Um, well, uh, I mean, the, this result says that if you take an encoded process, it will behave as the original one. So we are not taking, if I understood the question, an arbitrary calculus process that is using the encoded types. Because in that case, if I understand the question, the usage order may be different. We are taking specifically the encoded process that using our encoding does the right thing. I Is think it, we might take it offline. All right. Okay. Sorry. Jonathan? This is, uh, this is really nice work. Thank you. Um, I was curious in looking at your example. Uh, it, it looks symmetric. And in fact, many, many times when you go beyond two parties in a session, you do have symmetries. Is it possible, uh, does, your, does your theory and your implementation extend to uh, kind of arbitrary numbers of, of, of uh, kind of symmetric parties in a... Uh, of, of symmetric parties? What... Uh, so a multiplayer game that can have any number of players that all use the same protocol. Uh, where you mean the number of players is dynamic? Exactly, yeah. Oh, okay. Not in this setting. We, uh, we took the, let's say, classical multi-party theory where the number of participants is set uh, in the type statically. There are works that extend to dynamic number of participants, if I recall, from Daniello and Yoshida. And, uh, but the theory is much richer, so we need to look into that. At this stage, we wanted to make sure at least the basis works. Sure. So, thank you. Elias? So I think it's really nice. So historically, I've always seen session types as quite unwieldy, and now you showed this uh, this scholar code in the end, and it looks really nice. So my question is: Is there a, is there some overhead by using this system as opposed to to have you compared the performance with with other? The answer, uh, I think, is in the paper last year, in the sense that uh, the overhead depends on which transport, which message transport you use, and uh, depending on the transport, you, you, you may have more or less features. But uh, uh, essentially, the APIs we generate are really almost one-liners. They are really, really small. This is actually what the tool generates for you. And so the overhead uh, here, we did not measure it, but I would say it's pretty minimal. It's mostly some essentially variable uh, value assignments and then calls. The overhead may come from here when actually messages are sent by, sent by your channels. And then last, uh, in the last year measurements, we showed that the overhead uh, is usually very small. Uh, so we are confident that that result ap applies here as well. But Great. I did not. Thanks.
Right, any other question? There's another question from Jonathan, if, if nobody else, yeah. Does your encoding have a way of uh, preventing uh, kind of duplicate sends in a protocol? The Scala one or the formal one? Um, I guess uh, I guess both. <laughs> okay, no, the, um, the formal encoding in Lina Pi Calculus uh, pre prevents uh, duplicate sense because the Lina Pi Calculus has linear types. So the only thing that can uh, diverge if you only look at the types is that you may use the the composed channels in the wrong order. And uh, this is still type safe, but may introduce deadlocks. So that's why we also encode the processes and use them to preserve the behaviors. In Scala, instead, there is no linear tap checking. So what we do is uh, uh, what was called by Luca Padovani the ostrich approach. So essentially, we hope the developers will not try to use channels twice. And uh, if it happens, there is an immediate check inside the, this, this channel here. So there is a flag and an, errors, an error is raised immediately. And no extraneous messages are sent. So this is the quick follow-up comment. So there's work by myself and a colleague on uh, affine types in Scala. Last year, Uppsala, yeah. La Casa. So yeah, of yeah. course, there's Which something to be explored here. Definitely. Right. Definitely. Okay. So the session is over. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.